Hi, uh, my name is uh, Brandon Lawrence, and uh, I am from the University of Utah, and I am going to talk about uh, cell-based allografts. We're going to go through a little bit of the science, as well as some of the economics, and then a couple studies talking about the efficacy in cervical spine surgery. I just wanted to, um, first of all, thank uh, the Cervical Spine Research Society, as well as Dr. Gerling, for putting this together. Um, and um, and uh, here are my disclosures, none of which are pertinent to uh, discussion today. Um, so we'll start off with int introduction. Um, you know, I just wanted to go through a couple of things to sort of set the stage for cell-based allografts. Um, I do feel like there are uh, three factors to consider uh, in uh, deciding whether to utilize these, uh, these cell-based allografts and whether or not there's a preferred de design criteria. Um, when we go through and look at the at these cell-based allografts, you know, one of the most important things is looking at what cells are present and where they came from. Um, secondarily is the cell viability at the time of implantation. And then um, uh, almost more importantly is their survival post-implantation. And then finally the cost. Um, and there's three aspects to, to, to this, to this um, third consideration, which is you know, uh, how to use them, who to use them on, and how much do you need. Um, and so we'll go through a little bit of that during this talk. Um, so when we look at cell-based allografts, um, it's amazing how uh, uh, um, widespread their use is at this point. Almost 20% of bone grafting procedures uh, are using cell-based allografts, um, which equates to about $2.4 billion in, in 2020. Uh, the problem with uh, this is that uh, there are, are very few l large non-industry sponsored studies um, and those that are available are conflicting and uh, or not that promising and we'll go through a couple of those today. Uh, uh, all of the products that we're going to talk about, these are all snap frozen cells. And so when we look at these cell-based allografts, the, the nice thing about these is that they do contain uh, all three aspects that are needed to um, uh, form bone and, and therefore fusion. Um, and these snap frozen cells are the osteogenic portion of uh, the, the, the triad of uh, characteristics that you need. Um, these also are uh, uh, packaged with demineralized bone products, which are the osteoinductive uh, aspects of of this, uh, these cell-based allografts, and then finally some bone, which is um, osteoconductive. And so when we think about the products that are available today, um, there are two uh, broad categories. The first one is, is, is purely uh, uh, mesenchymal stem cells, which are the, the Trinity Evolution product, the Osteocell Plus product, and, and then Celentra. And then uh, interestingly, there's another product called Vivigen, um, <clears throat> which contains uh, lineage committed cells, um, meaning osteoblasts, uh, and we'll go through a little bit in that and why they, these may be, um, although from the outset may seem like uh, they are preferable, um, they may not be, and so we'll talk about that in just a second as well. Um, and so when we talk about the origin of cells, this is extremely important, and all the companies that are selling these um, are uh, very strict with uh, their donors. They're highly screened, um, as well as uh, looking at the age of the donor, as, um, uh, as especially for the mesenchymal stem cells, the MSC population decreases with age, so they try to get younger uh, donors. And then finally, the hematopoietic cells or the inflammatory cells, they all must be removed. Uh, the question is, is are they lineage committed? That's the, sort of the good news, bad news part to this, you know, and, 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 and when they are lineage committed, uh, you lose a little bit of that multipotency. Um, and, and you might think that a, a pure population of osteoblasts might be the right thing, but uh, a lot of people think that a uh, uh, less pure population allowing for sort of um, that multipotency uh, aspect of these mesenchymal stem cells um, to um, signal one another to go down the correct pathway may be preferable, but, um, but that's all sort of theory and speculation at this point. So when we look at um, uh, other, uh, the other aspects to these products, you know, mesenchymal stem cells, they are immunologically pr privileged. So they, they lack the HLA class two antigens, and so you're not gonna have a immune response. Um, but then what, what about the lineage committed cells? Well, these uh, in vitro assays that uh, looking at the Vivigen product uh, show non-immunogenicity, and so they are also um, not going to incite a, uh, uh, an immune response. And so when we look at the other uh, part of this is, you know, w with these products and the published cell numbers that come with these products, 
it's hard to know what that really means, uh, in my opinion. Um, the, the Trinity and the cilantro say about 250,000 MSCs are present, whereas the osteocell uh, talks about maybe 3 million cells, uh, and this is all per cc are present. Um, and so I'm not sure uh, how many cells we even need to uh, really kind of support or uh, get a fusion to um, uh, begin. And so um, when you look and break that further down into where the MSCs, uh, the Trinity product has a low number of MSCs, whereas the um, osteocell product has about 68% uh, of the cells are MSCs. And so you know, these are these are probably more marketing points than 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 uh, actually points that uh, we need to consider. But uh, but I just wanted you uh, all to be aware of what those numbers mean when you see them. Cell viability uh, pre as uh, well as post implantation. Well, they all have excellent cell viability pre -implant implantation if handled properly. Uh, these studies are all performed under ideal conditions, and so. Um, the real issue is post-implantation. Uh, this is what remains a concern, and we don't know at this point what happens to these these allograft cells um, that are that are implanted. But um, you know, the the low oxygen tension environment that that may be beneficial for fusion. Uh, but there is an inadequate nutrient supply secondary to the tissue disruption, and at this point, it's very poorly studied and, and remains a concern. Um, cost, this is when we get in and how to use them. And, you know, the most important thing is the pro thawing process. Uh, the, th the cryopreservative must be removed and, and each product has its own protocol for preparation. And so as long as you follow that very carefully and have the staff in the operating room follow that very carefully, then it shouldn't be a problem. But each product is different, so you have to pay attention to that. The majority of studies to date really evaluate one and two level fusions, um, and, and this does appear to be safe in anterior cervical surgery uh, in comparison to BMPs. Um, and so um, when we look at these cell-based allografts, though, uh, much like Infuse, I do feel like they should be limited to higher risk patients due to their expense, and we'll go through that in a minute. Um, and when you're first using these, it's probably worthwhile to initially use on less complex patients so that you can kind of see in your hands how these, uh, how these work. Um, and when we look at some of the differences between the types of surgeries that we do, um, you know, the single level fusion is a lot different than this multi-level deformity uh, procedure. And so, again, we don't really know um, who to use them on. Um, and so, and so we're going to have to utilize a lot of a lot of people out there who are using these uh, these products already to hopefully um, submit and publish some of their results. And so when we look at the cost, um, and this is these are published cost numbers, so there's nothing proprietary here. Um, but and when we look at the differences between uh, the tr the uh, cell-based allografts at the top compared to Infuse, um, you know this is this is the smallest uh, the two milligram extra small package of Infuse. Um, you know it's much more expensive at the small numbers. As we get up to five cc's, the cost gets a little bit closer, but still cheaper for the cell-based allografts. And then for the medium, as well as the large kits of the BMP, the, uh, the cost is pretty similar between those two. Um, and again, I don't know how to counsel you on, on what you would need for um, you know, 1 cc's versus 5 cc's. I, I, still, I still don't know how to make sense of that with, with the literature that we have. And so when we look at the actual studies, um, this is a study looking at uh, 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 ACDFs, just single level. It's a multi-center prospective study. Um, and when you look at the, uh, the design of this, it's all comparison to historical controls. And this is with the Trinity Evolution uh, cell-based allograft. Um, and so when we look at these, this was, this was 31 patients with Trinity in peak spacers. Um, the fusion rates, as you look at these, were uh, 78.6 at six months and then 93.5 at 12 months. And when you look at those numbers, that's pretty um, consistent with uh, an allograft product. Uh, and, and, and these are single level comparison to historical control, so, so not really um, that scientifically rigorous. When we look at uh, the next study, which kind of starts to bring a little bit of light, um, this is a systematic review looking at 22 studies, one or two level ACDFs using bone craft substitutes. And when you look at uh, the different kind of bone craft substitu substitutes and their fusion rates, BMP showed 100% fusion. Allograft spacers, um, this showed a 93.5% fusion. The MSCs, which was using Alistem and Trinity, Trinity is still available, Alistem is not. Um, these were 87.7%. Um, 
and then ceramics were in the in or the lowest at 80 percent so when you look at this these uh these mscs it appears as though for routine acdfs um allografts are the most economical with similar fusion rates and outcomes and so the challenges all pro all of these products do have proprietary um intellectual properties um, therefore it's difficult to know exactly what you're getting the second part to this is the literature is not great um, and we still don't know what the right patient is for these uh, kinds of products. Uh, the third uh, challenge is in the current environment of cost containment, these products are expensive and so you have to be very, very diligent in how you use them and, and they may be difficult to justify. Um, and due to their allergenic nature, the viability post-implantation is difficult to assess and still a problem which we need to address. And then finally, the literature is not that supportive for efficacy. So when we come down to conclusions, you know, think about these, th these three things. What cells are present? Where did they come from? Their cell viability at the time of implantation and survival post. And then finally, the cost. How to use them, who to use them on, and how much do you need? Thank you.